So it is on the basis of that young man, the, the young man who just spoke, the last young man who just spoke, um, that we're going to have a conversation right now. Because he says, well, you know what, I was just walking somewhere. And this me and, and is going to guarantee. And if you look at the Electoral Commission's own statistics, I'm going to show you. At some point during the registration period. The Electoral Commission says there are a lot more people relying on the Garanta system to be registered than the Ghana card. So now, according to Graphic Online, there's a, there's a story attributed to the Electoral Commission chair today, as pub published by Graphic Online. And, and they're quoting here that at the Interparty Advisory Committee meet today, the issue of Ghana card was discussed extensively. And I, EC Chair, think the advice was that going forward, the EC look at laying the bill that seeks to ensure that the Ghana card is the sole document for the identification of a citizen. And she goes on, the EC still holds that view, that the Ghana card will help to cure the busing of minors and the infiltration of minors into our voters' register. And she's not alone in this, because if you recall... Um, sometime on the 13th of May, the Deputy Commissioner at the Electoral Commission, Dr. Eric Bosman Asari, also made that same point, that the Garanta system continues to dominate the forms of identification used in the 2024 registration exercise. Now, as was in the case in the 2023 exercise as well, and this is something the Electoral Commission is not proud of because it is used by political parties and certain persons to facilitate the registration of unqualified persons, such as minors and so on, um, in, in, in the register. This, so this is the position of the Electoral Commission with regards to the Garanta system. They, in their view, it is not the way to go. And it is not one that has to be admitted in any way, shape or form. Now, so today... The EC chair is, is very clear in, in, in her mind, or has made a position quite clear, and we do know how the first attempt to introduce a CI to have the Ghana card as a sole document for registration hit a snag in Parliament. There was a unanimous decision by both the MPP and the NDC in Parliament that, look, this cannot go through. The Electoral Commission has to come back again on it. Well, guess what? The EC chair, based on this story as published, is giving a clear indication that, according to her, the poly both political parties or the political parties at the IPAC meeting today agreed that something must be done. And, and that includes laying another bill to make the Ghana card a sole document for identification and registration. Shortly, we'll be joined by Dr. Tanko Computer who is the Deputy Director of IT and Elections for the NDC. We also have uh, been joined by uh, also the Deputy General Secretary of the New Patriotic Party, Alhaj Haruna Mohammed. Gentlemen, good evening. Thank you so much for joining us here on Ghana Tonight. First of all, let me start off with you, Dr. Rashid Tanko. Your boss, Dr. Mani Buama, was at the IPAC meeting today. Did you get any briefing that there was an agreement for the Electoral Commission to lay a bill to, as it were, make the Ghana card the sole document for identification and registration? Uh, Alfred, let me say good evening to your cherished viewers. I was actually at the IPAC meeting uh, this morning. I attended a meeting with my boss, Dr. Mani Buama, and my colleague, Yaira Kuku. Uh, we were representing NDC at the IPAC meeting. Hmm. Uh, and uh, that we made it very clear. There was nothing like that in the agenda for today's discussion. We never discussed anything about Ghana card uh, CI to be laid in parliament. There was no discussion of that whatsoever. What we discussed was uh, a review of the voter registration exercise, uh, uh, which we look at uh, some of the difficulties the Electoral Commission went through. Uh, especially the network challenges, the breakdown of the DVRs, uh, uh, and the minors uh, getting onto the uh, uh, register. 
I mean, these were some of the issues we discussed. Then the, the commissioner, uh, Mrs. Jean Mensah, uh, was very emphatic that if the ASEA had gone through and then the Ghana card was used as a sole uh, 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 qualification document, this issue of minors getting to the register wouldn't have been an issue at all. It would have resolved itself. This is how she came in. And then we all looked at it and we said, look, even the Ghana card had challenges. We told them, the Ghana card, the issue of fake Ghana cards in the system, and secondly, NIE uh, not being economical with the truth in terms of the distribution of the Ghana cards they were talking of. Because if you look at the data presented to us there, it was clear that almost 63% of registrants use the guarantee system. And that means that a lot of people don't have the Ghana card. If you, even if you look at the last one, the, the last one, the last 2023 register, the same thing, almost 63% uh, went to the electoral rule using the guarantee system. So that means the NIE has all along not been telling Ghanaians the truth about the, the distribution of the Ghana card. So if they, we had relied on the Ghana card, that means this huge number of registrants wouldn't, wouldn't have gotten this opportunity to, to get into the electoral room. So we're saying that until such a time that uh, uh, every Ghanaian or a good number of Ghanaians uh, have their Ghana card, the issue of them talking of it being as a sole document for registration should, is, no, is neither here nor there. Uh, so it came in, it just chipped in in, in, the, in the discussion of the review of the register. So it wasn't an issue at all there. So I was surprised when I heard uh, one of your sister station, Media House, published that uh, a new CI was going to be put in Parliament to make Ghana card. There was nothing like that. We never discussed anything like that. Story published by Graphic Online. They are quoting the EC chair. So that's an interview that they had with her. So um, if you're saying nothing of the sort was discussed, then that's actually a, a reaction to it. Um, but stay on with me, uh, Dr. Arshid Tanko. I also have Haruna Mohammed. Is a deputy general secretary of the NPP, also joining us on the telephone. Good evening. Thank you very much for joining us here on Ghana tonight. First of all, uh, now the NDC says, look, not, nothing of a sort was discussed at the IPAC meeting. No conversation on the EC going back to Parliament with another bill to make the Ghana card the sole document for registration. Did you also get that indication or any briefing from your rep there? Um, thank you very much, Alfred. I will say good evening to your cherished uh, U.S. and you yourself and my colleague, brother, Tango uh, Rashid Computer. Uh, indeed, I was not present at the meeting, but I, 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 I took briefings from uh, Minister Otiamua, uh, who was representing the MTP at the meeting. Uh, indeed, um, there was no such discussion that was put on the agenda, as my colleague has said, but uh, there was a report by Obi Amwa uh, on that particular matter uh, relative to the fact that 63% of people who are using uh, these guarantee system in 14 or so, but 30 something percent or so who are also use the Ghana card system. So he raised the issue about how this particular system is uh, having a loophole on the registration exercise. That will allow many people who hitherto wouldn't have had that particular credentials to do. He also pointed to the fact that there were people who had Ghana card, and because their ages are not up to 18, it's like with two or three months, some of them, most of them, had abandoned the Ghana card and went ahead to uh, go ahead to do the registration of their votes, which is also affecting the use of the Ghana card. So he brought up that issue, but it was not an agenda on the particular uh, 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 meeting that was conducted. And the point must be made very clear. The EC uh, never laid even a CI before Parliament. Because we all know how CIs are laid. They were it was a draft CI that seek to uh, introduce the fact that we should stay on to the use of Ghana card. But that is not materialized because they were uh, opposition from the, the NDC because it has to go to the legislative, uh, uh, the, the, the committee that is uh, responsible for that, which is chaired by Dominic Ayini. 
So these matters are properly discussed in there. It doesn't lie in the mouth of political parties to decide whether the Electoral Commission should go and lay a new CI in Parliament to regulate the elections. It was agreed that we all go and use the existing CI, which is CI-91 and CI-126. So well, that's a, in, that, uh, in, in true fact, there was no such discussion, but a matter came up that there was no agreement that uh, electoral commission should go. It doesn't lie in our mouth to agree electoral commission should go and lay. They can do so because they are constitutionally mandated and groomed to go and lay a CI in parliament, either agree or not agree by political parties. I think that's not in doubt. That, that power of the electoral commission is not in doubt. The fundamental question that I was asking is whether this was a matter of conversation or discussion at the IPAC meeting today. And I think both of you the NPP and the NDC, represented at the IPAC today, have indicated that this was not discussed. But based on the quote attributed to the EC chair in that story on Graphic Online, it says that the matter was extensively discussed at the IPAC meeting. And that's what we wanted to find out. If indeed it was the case that it was extensively discussed, you say that that did not happen. So if, if the Electoral Commission, Dr. Dr. Tanko, if the Electoral Commission now goes ahead to lay a new bill or, or try to get Parliament to consider a new bill um, for, to make the Ghana card the sole document because of all the issues they have raised, that this guarantor system has aided some minors and foreigners to get onto the registration, will, will, will the NDC back this? Uh, Alfred, it's not the issue of NDC backing it. It's the issue of, of the data. If you look at the data as of now, it's very clear that the Ghana card cannot be the sole uh, uh, qualification document to get uh, a registrant into the, re uh, the register. Clearly, if you look at it, the, the data is telling us that 63% of Ghanaians, qualified Ghanaians, are 18 years ab and above, went through the, the, the guarantor system. And we are saying the NIA should come clean. The NIA, are, they are not giving us correct data. They are not, they are being economical with the truth about their operation. And that is what we are talking about. So the issue is not about we really supporting it. Yes, we everybody want to have a, a clean, uh, a transparent process, but that doesn't mean that uh, 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 we should just accept anything that is waived on us. If we are Agree, agreed and accepted that they should go ahead with the, 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 the Ghana card. Your guess is as good as mine. These large numbers of Ghanaians wouldn't have gotten access to the, to the register. And then so, for now, and we also pointed out to them, like I was saying, their own statement, the Electoral Commission own statement, when the issue of Pusiga came up, identified that they were fake Ghana cards. Numbers being used to get into the, into the room. And today we discuss it, and it came. It was an issue, and so for now we need to take a second look at this Ghana card. Much as we think that that is a document that can resolve our our identity issue, it also has its own flaws. And secondly, the Electoral Commission data doesn't read with the the NIA data, and so there was a loophole in the registration process. That's why people could fake Ghana card and money their way through the registration. So we are saying that at least there should be some collaboration between NIA and, and, and Electoral Commission so that their data can read each other. All right. When these two data read each other and you bring any, any document which is fake, it can easily it, pick it, it up. It can detect it. And okay. make the yeah. Right. Oh, okay. Dr. Ashitanko, computer, thank you very much for this. And so if the Ghana card in itself, the registration process has its own flaws and the guarantor system also has flaws as the electoral commission has stated then which system will be foolproof enough for us to employ to ensure that we don't have minors and foreigners on our electoral roll that's the question that remains outstanding and unanswered but thank you for joining us on Ghana tonight and to you as well Alaji Aruna Mohammed thank you thank you you, uh, you, you want to say something in a minute? In a minute, yes, yes please. Uh, yes, um, um, one thing that OB had stated was that there should be a means of which we can synchronize the data 
of the uh, the electoral commission and that of the uh, the NIA, where somebody comes and the age is left with two months, and the person decides to reduce, and the person wants to reduce and then uh, uh, get him or herself registered, the data will be able to catch okay. that particular person. But for us, me as MPP, we are for Ghana card being used because. Was fully right from King to talk. The NGC never wanted even the registration, the biometric voter registration system. All right. We raised the issue in 2020, and we have to also abandon and come back with a new one that will reduce minors and foreigners. We okay. are still going to make improvements on this matter, and I stand by the point that we must get rid of the use of the guarantee system. All right. Elijah uh, Aaron uh, thank you. Deputy General Secretary of the NPP, thank you for joining us. Um, at that first attempt, there was an unanimous decision by both the NPP and NDC in Parliament for the Electoral Committee to go back and, and do some things right. Uh, Dr. Rashid Tanko Computer, you are making reference to a pie chart that the Electoral Commission itself put out with respect to the sources of um, authentication of the, uh, it were, the registration period at least based on what we do know, based on the Electoral Commission's own data published on their website and also on Facebook, 62.1% of the persons as of day 11 who registered relied on the Garanta system and about 37% relied on the Ghana card and then also 0.28% on the passport. So it is indeed the case that a lot more people who registered within the 23-day period relied on the Garanta system as the way of authenticating their identity and then also their nationality for that matter. So if, if the, the Garanta system that was heavily relied on during this registration period, the Electoral Commission says, has flaws and may have just given room for minors and foreigners to get onto the electoral roll. There's a lot more conversation that needs to be had on this. Thank you, gentlemen, for joining us. And coming up next, Sean Ghana tonight, getting information that President Kofado has directed the Employment and Labor Relations Minister to meet organized labor over the sale of the 60% of SNIT's stake in some four hotels for a conversation. Now, this is at least what we do know, right? I'm going to put that on the screen. And the organized labor has indeed confirmed it after a meeting with President Kofado. That's what we do know right now based on this. But earlier today, Dr. Mahmoud Bamiya, the flag bearer of the NPP, the current vice president, met organized labor. And this matter of the SNIT's intended sale to, to Brian e. Champong, and that's a rock city owned by Brian e. Champong, came up. And this is what the vice president had to say at that meeting today. Take a look. Restructuring the white paper on SNIT saying that we have to restructure SNIT and then the governance structure. Uh, I think I could not disagree with you uh, in this particular, on this particular issue uh, because the workers are the owners of the funds and therefore it's very clear that they must have a say uh, or even the decisive stay because I mean if the workers decide to put their funds in a bad Please, is the workers who are going yeah. to suffer, isn't it? So I, I don't, I think we can definitely look at the the governance structure issue. The other major issue that you have raised is essentially the the single spine, which is non-existent. Uh, uh, or you talk about this apartheid system and the multiple spines. Uh, this is not the first time I've heard about uh, this issue. Well, Dr. Isaac Bampuado, who leads the forum, also had this to say when Dr. Mahmoud Bamiya met organized, the leadership of organized labor earlier today with respect to this net matter. Take a look. I want to shut him to say, Honorable, this net is killing us. People are talking about Brian. Brian is a businessman. Any businessman will take advantage of whatever if your systems are not in place. Please, the white paper said SNIT should be restructured. SNIT must be restructured. This is the time. 
And one thing that we, the forum, in collaboration with organizers, will be fighting for is the governance structure of SNIT. Because the SNIT money is not government money. Well, let's have a conversation on this matter, because this is the news that came through not too long ago. And Austin Game is an international labor expert, and he's joining us from Harare, um, where he is attending, and in fact, uh, a speaker at an ongoing conference on international labor relations. Mr. Game, appreciate your time. Thank you so much for connecting with us here in Ghana, on Ghana tonight. Now... What posture should the leadership of organized labor go into this meeting that we understand the president has instructed the labor minister to meet them on with respect to this SNIT intended sale of some of its hotels to Brian e. Champo? Thank you. Um, and thank you for having me. Honestly, labor is fully aware that they are representing millions and millions of people who directly own these monies that are being invested in trust and again holding it in trust uh, for them and that people will be at the uh, vulnerable state at the time of uh, having access to the pension and therefore, they are not going to the meeting as individuals who uh, are just speaking because they are union leaders. The vulnerability, life and death of the people whose money are being held in trust by SNIT is on the hands of the organ of organized labor leadership. So whatever they say, their conscience should prick them and to know that under no circumstance should they represent and make decision on our behalf, not having the consent of the people which has already been expressed seriously. And therefore, I have confidence in them that they are men of good conscience of integrity and that the president himself of course being the number one gentleman of the land fully aware of the fact that the people whose matter is being talked about are at their vulnerable states mm. that nothing can be done to satisfy any individual or group right. of people no, at I their expense perfect point but the government should this controversial transaction as it's turning out to be between SNIT and Rock City owned by Brian e. Champong, the a Greek minister MP for Abitifi, trigger a holistic review of SNIT's investment port portfolio so we know where they have put our monies, workers, pensioners, where they have put our monies, which investments have they put our monies into? and how things are playing out now. So we are not taken by surprise. Should, should it lead to that holistic review? I mean, it, they don't say it. It will happen. And it is going to be uh, compulsory and will have to be done, no matter what. Now people will have to become interested in those who are selected to be on the board of SNIT. And I would like to know at certain stages Key decision making meetings, such as investment decisions to be made, the people whose money they hold, to some extent, might be consulted. And some of them, not all, but such as key things like sale of hotels or other business interests, and how the scheme is satisfying, we must be interested. And therefore, it's important that they take note of it. Mm -hmm. It will never happen like this again. In, 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 indeed. And, and if, you, if you look at Ms. Gunn, before I let you go, I know you need to run back in and, and prepare for, for, for the conference. But this is a major issue, and it's triggered some conversation about 
the decision SNIT itself takes, there's a talk about restructuring SNIT. Now, for you, what are the major takeaways from this? So that while we are dealing with the transaction separately, we also are looking at other ways of ensuring that this does not happen again. It's the most bitterest lesson, and that Ghanaians, almost all Ghanaians who have a stake in the affairs of SNIT should know that there is no other way than for them to become a little vocal, but responsibly in ensuring that matters of this nature are not swept under any carpet. It will have to be transparently discussed and that perhaps the system of AGM or all other businesses that you know, the people have shares in it will have to be introduced in the case of SNITs. And they cannot just be taking decisions on some of the issues without the consent of the owners of the money. Who are just, some are laborers, some are below laborers, and, and so forth and so on. It's, it's a very, very difficult choice. If I were not to serve on the Pensions Commission, I would not know mm. how vulnerable people who are on pension look like. We must be careful those we represent. Indeed. And, and that's exactly uh, the sentiments that many have right now. Mr. Osengame, appreciate your time. Thank you for connecting with us here on Ghana tonight. Osengame is a labor expert uh, connecting with us from Harare where he uh, is speaking at uh, International Labor Relations Conference. Thank you for joining us here on Ghana tonight. Coming up next, quite some worrying news we're hearing from Morocco. Uh, some Ghanaian students studying in Morocco under the government scholarship, they picketed sometime over the weekend, but we want to find out if they are picketing at the Embassy of Ghana in Ramat, Morocco has yielded any results. We're getting distressing calls from some of them. You see the lady crying there that they cannot even afford sanitary parts. And uh, some of them are resorting to other means to, to survive, which is not looking good. So we would have a conversation on this matter here on Ghana tonight. And, and stay with me because we also have the National Union of Ghana students also joining us the president of the National Union of Ghana Students joining us on this. But we'll cross over to Morocco shortly after this quick break here on Ghana tonight. Don't go away because the story is chilling to say the least. We'll tell you about it after this quick break. Stay with us. Welcome back. This is Ghana Tonight. Now, some students, Ghanaian students studying in Morocco under the Morocco Scholarship Program um, from the government of Ghana, on, that over the weekend staged a protest over the delays in the release of their stipends. Now, the, this picketing took place at the Ghana Embassy in Morocco, specifically Rabat, Morocco. And according to the students, the prolonged delay has resulted in difficulties, emotional distress, risks, and, and economic challenges. And that's, this happened in the city of Rabat in Morocco. Let's, let's listen to them. Let's. We are pleading with the government of Ghana to come to our aid. As ladies here in this country, we are not even able to afford like the basic needs, sanitary parts, and the ways of it all is like your parents will send you money and it gets here, it's nothing. You can't even take us as people. Why should you leave your country and come to this place and suffer? But it's not our fault. We we're sent here by the government on a scholarship. Brilliant but needy students. The people you see behind me are people from very needy homes and they got a government scholarship to come and stay. Now, it has been more, more than 10 months. We are going to the 11th month without our stipends. We live in a country where rent is $120 per month. That's the cheapest you can get at a place without security. 
but we managed to leave there because even the stipends we are having is not enough. Now, it has been almost 11 months without the stipends. The question is, how do we survive? Our landlords are chasing us from, from, from our apartment. Some of us are sleeping with our friends. Some of us are sleeping outside. Imagine sending your daughter to an Islamic country to come and study for 10 months without sending him money to pay his rent. How do you want us to survive? There are people having debts and they are, they are chasing them. And people are depressed. The last time we had someone who nearly committed suicide. We are asking you, maybe you might say that we are making noise. This is not noise. This is not a story we are telling. This is not a narrative. This is what we are going through. Our lives are in danger. We are begging you wherever you are. Mr. President, we are begging you. If you don't come in, there will be blood on your hands. We are begging you. If you don't get paid in less than one week, there will be blood on your hands. Wherever you are, please cry for us. We don't have families here. You are home. At least you have somewhere to sleep. If I was home and I'm hungry, I can go to my father's house and sleep. I don't have anywhere to sleep. And I can't go to school. I came here to stay, but I don't go to school because there is nothing to, to, to. We are begging you, please. Some people are already chased from the apartment and they are sleeping outside. And next week, we don't know what is ha what will happen to the rest of us who are hosting some of our friends. So please, we are begging you, come in for us. Mr. President, we beg you. If you don't come in, there might be blood on your hands. We beg you. Uh, I mean, that's, that's, that's the, the, their reality. That's the ordeal that these Ghanaian students um, in Morocco are going through. They had to kneel down to, to just send a message and plead. Well, let's cross over to Rabat. The city of Rabat in Morocco right now, Dr. Emmanuel John Ayite is the president of the Ghanaian Students Association in Morocco. He's joining us from Rabat. Appreciate your time, Dr. Emmanuel John Ayite, connecting with us here on Ghana tonight. First of all, after this picketing that we just saw at the Embassy of Ghana in Morocco, Rabat, has there been any positive or good development or, or some feedback? Okay, thank you. Um, we heard um, from the Embassy of Ghana uh, in Morocco um, that the leaders have picked it up and uh, there have been movements um, in the scholarship secretariat. Um, but then as in the concrete message, we still don't have a concrete message as in we are releasing the money or the money will be released in this date and that date. So uh, prior to that, uh, I don't think we have any um, verdict mm. on the date of releasing of the money. And, and that's quite serious. It's, is it not? I mean, based on at least the fact that you were expecting something more than just assurances about 10 months now however mm -hmm. uh if this month ends we are already in 29 so it will be 11 months very serious that's getting to a year that's a year of not being paid of stipends of monthly allowance of students on scholarship government scholarship i see but how, how have you been coping i mean because you're telling that it's been almost 11 months so at the end of, by end of may it will be 11 months that you haven't received the stipends so you there, I mean, the Ghanaian students, how have you been coping? Um, it's, it's a struggle. We, the, we are really struggling. The students are really going through a lot, a lot, a lot. As I said in my previous videos, uh, we are not coping well. The students are not coping well. There are a lot of students that are sick that have not been able to receive correct medical attention. You know, there are some students that are having some issues with the police because their cuts have not been renewed. 
you know, we have students that have uh, abandoned their final year projects because of lack of stipends. We have students that have to walk for miles from their houses to um, the, the place of studies. If I give example, like let's say um, from Kaswa to Kaneshi, people walk that miles before they get to the destination of studies. We have students that barely eat once a day before they go to sleep. Um, it, the situation is very, very critical. And um, uh, we have students that are always, you know, um, crying. They are always, always crying. They, they call me on a call and it is just tears upon tears upon tears because of what they are going through. Some are ladies, some are ladies and you see what they are going through. Uh, it's 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 very, very disgracing when you see, or it's very, very somehow very sad when you see a lady, you know, asking um, a, a guy for money for sanitary pads and certain, um, certain stuffs, you know, it is very, very, uh, very, very sad in such situations. And so when you come here, the students are not actually coping well. They are not actually coping well, sir. I see, but, but, but I just want to establish this. Over the 10 months period, what were you being told? I mean, as president of the Ghanaian students there, I'm sure within this 10 month period, you were trying to get answers as to why your stipends weren't coming in regularly on a monthly basis. What explanation was given to you? Um, when we started, it was, uh, just, uh, we're told to just hold on, uh, the money will be paid very soon. And then, uh, we go to hear as the president, I got to hear, uh, that there had been, um, a delay due to the changes in the financial, uh, the finance minister or in the finance ministries. And so we had to wait for a while. And then now we are being told also that the, there is a warrant that has to, you know, be given and stuff. It's a whole lot of uh, messages that we've been hearing. And so it is messages upon messages upon messages. And uh, all of them have, has not yielded to anything as at now. So. I see. And, and even after the picketing, all you're receiving is words of, of encouragement and motivation and so on. But here's what I want you to do. You are, you are live on TV, on TV3 here in Ghana. And maybe the picketing you did was directed specifically at the ambassador there. But I want you to speak directly to the authorities in Ghana. Maybe the president, the vice president, somebody close to him is watching you right now. So, Dr. Aite... S speak, speak to them. So, um, I will use the opportunity. First off, I greet um, His Excellency and uh, uh, every um, um, every authority involved. Um, we thank them first of all for giving us this opportunity, and uh, we know that it is because of the opportunity that we are here. Um, however, um, we are going through a lot as students here in Morocco. Um, we are suffering. The students are going through a lot of pain. We have students, sir, uh, that have um, developed some mental issues. Students that need therapy, as I'm talking to you now. Uh, students that need serious health care now. Uh, students that need... Uh, money to settle their apartment issues. Some have been thrown. Just now, just today, I had a call that uh, a person has been thrown out of the apartment in Tonji. And so day in and day out, we hear these news. And so we beg you, um, all authorities involved in releasing our money, we are pleading with you to please come to our aid. If not, um, we would have uh, bad news uh someone can lose his or her life i keep saying or we'll have people going through a lot of depression 
and a lot of um, some kind of uh, mental illness that is irreversible. And so we are pleading with you, sir. We are pleading with, um, I would not want to state um, uh, government or anything, but we are pleading with authorities that are involved, authorities that are involved in releasing our stipends. We are pleading with you to uh, release it as soon as possible so that we, the students, can live at peace here because we are not at peace. We are not happy. We are not uh, ourselves here. And we are pleading with you that you come to our aid so that everything would go well, at least averagely well for each and every Ghanaian student here. We beg you. Right. We All beg right. you. And uh, we certainly do align with this plea that you're making. Uh, Dr. Emmanuel Jonaite, thank you. Thank you very much for joining us. And, but you, you wanted to say something quickly before we go again? Quickly? Yes? Zaite? Okay, we, we we are really grateful for the opportunity given to us to also um, outcry to the government and those involved, and we beg them, we beg them. There are new students that are here. There are new students that are here. People are going through a lot. People are going through a lot. There are a lot of people that came here are not from well-to-do families. They are not from well-to-do families. So if they call home, the family is not able to help. The family is not able to help because they we they have the hope from the government that, oh, we are, we are sending you here and we are going to take care of you. And so if a family member wants to send this child money, it's just 100, 100 cities or like 200 cities. When it comes here, it's just $10. It is $20. It, it can barely... It can barely buy something it can it can barely buy something for even a week and so the students are really going through a lot the students are really some of them are not even having money to buy clothes to protect themselves some of them are not even able to pay the apartment some of them are sleeping on the floor it is it is the situation is very critical as we are talking about uh words cannot express words cannot express we are really pleading to you Please, please come to our aid. Please. We beg you. Honestly, uh, thank you. Thank you. I mean, no words can explain exactly what you're going through there. And we align with this. And guess what? Dr. Emmanuel Jonaite, thank you for even gathering the strength to speak to us tonight. What we can do is also ask questions and knock on the doors of the appropriate authorities for you as well to get some answers for you. So we will not rest our oars on this matter. We will we'll get back to you on this. But thank you for joining us. Dr. Emmanuel John Aite is the president of the Ghanaian Students Association in Morocco. He's joined us from Rabat, the city of Rabat, where a number of them are. Thank you for joining us here on Ghana tonight. On behalf of the rest of the team, do make some time and join us same time tomorrow. My name is Alfred Akonsi. Have a good night.